So walk me through your psyche right now of like celibacy. For a long time, I wasn't even willing to say I'm off that train. And even now, like even when you asked me earlier, I'm like, I'm conflicted. I'm kind of in the middle. So I'm never completely rejecting being abstinent. I just know that right now it's a struggle like it's never been before. So I think that's the huge difference between how I'm walking it out now and why it still remains more of a conflict now compared to then. I was just like, I'm going to lock myself in this room. I'm not going anywhere. That's it. Because I knew the minute I step outside, something might happen. Lovers and friends. Lovers and friends. I'm going to take you on a trip, baby. I don't pretend. I say, lovers and friends. Uh, I'm going to hold you down, down to the end. I say, Celibacy, abstinence, or as I recently discussed on a YouTube video on my main channel, sex strikes. Women, y'all grant access to sex. So if you want to have a serious relationship, you're trying to build something with somebody and you're not giving them sex, they can get it somewhere else. Interestingly, as someone who talks about sex for a living, I find myself talking about not having sex a whole lot too. And even like right now, I'm in currently in a season where I'm like, I really don't give a fuck about fucking. Remember being in a space where I thought like I would never have sex again. I think people would be really disappointed to hear currently about our sex life. Becoming celibate was also my way of like taking out any confusion. Cause a lot of times we confuse lust with love and I didn't want that confusion. My question was, if I save myself, will I end up with the happily ever after? I'll tell people, I say, listen, I know from a biblical, from a spiritual standpoint, I want to encourage you guys to wait, but I understand we all don't make it that far. The last voice you heard belongs to Stefan Laborsier, AKA Stefan Speaks, one of the most popular voices in the relationship education space and the starring guest on this week's episode, which if you don't know, this is Lovers and Friends, the podcast hosted by me, Sham Boudram, a public facing sex and relationship expert who you just might have seen on Netflix is Too Hot to Handle, X rated with Andy Cohen, or through my Hung Up podcast, where you definitely have never heard or seen me before, though, is Red Table Talk because I've never been before. But I can now say that I know somebody who has. What's up? What's up? <laughs> Let's start this podcast with all the things I'm going to cut out. Uh, <laughs> starting with, well, I won't cut this out. Big fan of your work. Thank Great you. admirer. Congrats on the success. Thank you. Appreciate I have to that. ask you about your experience of Red Table Talk. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was good. It was really good. Um, what else are you going to say? <laughs> you ain't going to come with I mean, the real. You're not going to be like, the snacks were subpar. Yeah. I mean, listen, I was taken aback by how big of a production it was. Yes. All right. So I didn't expect all it's at of their this. house. Yeah. So you're thinking you're just pulling up. You're seeing like Willow in the front yard. Exactly. Roller skating. <laughs> exactly. So to see the trailers and all these production, production members, it was a lot. But no, it was really good. I mean, it was a really passionate um energetic discussion and so it was it was really cool and everybody Read was really good debate yeah <laughs> <laughs> where i left hating half the people <laughs> no, it was, was it good. like heated or was it um I, I, i'm not gonna okay i'm gonna be very real it wasn't heated all right i was surprised at some of the the disagreements that we were having all right with particular people on, on the cast i don't want to call the particular people out Matthew but, Hussey. you know. <laughs> Stefan is a certified relationship coach, a speaker, and author. Some of his top videos are, when a man deeply loves you, he will start saying these seven things. And how men view sex, what you really need to know. Topics that I think are very interesting and I should have talked about, but we didn't. Because we talked about something that is very pressing, pertinent, and real for him right now. And that is his on again, off again, should we call it quits or give it one last good try relationship with celibacy. Stefan has devoted himself to a life of celibacy on more than one occasion. First run with the intention to connect with God, second to connect with his God-given purpose, and now he finds himself conflicted between looking for that clarity that celibacy seemed to give him before, while also longing for the intimacy he desires as a healthy, single, eligible bachelor today. It is, what, like, you, like you said, it is exactly what you said, is me trying to figure out how to properly navigate this. Because the other thing I will say for me is I'm obsessed with 
reaching my fullest potential. To do that, again, it's, it's crazy because as I continue to level up, my sexual energy continues to increase. You know what I'm saying? And it's just constant trying to balance it all. Ooh, let me just say it's about to be a good one. And I am so grateful that Stefan came to Lovers and Friends during this on the fence phase because yes, conviction can be very inspiring to hear, but confliction can also be extremely illuminating as you listen to somebody's thought processes as they weigh out the pros and cons for themselves. And as Stefan put during our interview in his experience, it wasn't the act of abstaining for sex that brought about positive change, but it was the intention, the clear intention behind abstaining that led to some really powerful shifts, especially if you are able to maintain a high sex drive throughout your period of abstaining, allowing you to funnel the power of your sexual energy to other efforts. This is a practice known as sexual transmutation. And those of you who watch Too Hot to Handle on Netflix know that I did a workshop on this. So sexual energy is your life force that connects you to the drive, creativity, and power that you possess as an awakened sexual and sensual being. We are all sexual and sensual to some degree. Sexual frustration occurs when you want to have sex, but you can't, and then you feel heavy about the lack of desire, either that you have or others have towards you. On the flip side, sexual transmutation occurs when you have sexual energy and you wanna put it somewhere, but you choose to direct that energy towards something else, like art or work or worship. At its best, sex promotes confidence, courageousness, spontaneity, freedom, health, creativity, and of course, connection. At its worst though, Sex can be distracting, draining, damaging, dull, defeating, and it can cause intimate distance because of resentment. And if you identify with any of those Ds, thinking about the C word could definitely be a really good idea. And I say could because celibacy as a band-aid could help us, could heal us, or it could hurt us, depending on what's really underneath. So it's a life choice that is worth overanalyzing, worth talking in depth about, and worth listening to nuanced perspectives on in order to see what hits or misses for you. Because choosing to approach your sex life in a different way is a huge and important decision, whether that deliberation leads to celibacy or something different. And again, that is why I'm really grateful to share Stefan's layered story with you. Plus, please stick around till the end of the episode, end of his interview, because I'm going to be answering some of your questions and sharing some of your experiences with, with abstaining from sex. It was approached to me, should, we should go celibate until we got married, even though we had already been having sex. The information that I got out of it about what I wanted for the next person that I allowed to enter my body was pivotal. He has millions of followers, five books, countless podcast appearances, including on Lewis Howe's The School of Greatness, and he's been featured in GQ and Huffington Post. Stefan speaks of love, and he has a whole lot of it to give. Now, how, where, and when does he give that love? That's what we're about to get into right after this. You don't have to shout it from the rooftops. You don't have to write it down, but I do want you to finish this sentence. I deserve a sex life that is now. Do not be afraid to name it because whatever it is, you deserve it. And if you're feeling stumped right now, you deserve to find your it. And Dipsy can help you get there. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Even just talking about sexy stories making me bring my sexy out. And if it's not, lie to me. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. Discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot hookups. And this part really hit all my buttons. Dipsy is radically inclusive. They have stories for straight and queer listeners. And 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. Now you have never heard celebrities before like this. You get to hear stories voice acted by Sharonis J. Jackson, the hottest, the coolest, the flyest, what's up friend, ER Fightmaster, and Luke Cook. New content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can also find something new to explore. They also have soothing sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories that you can read if that's your flavor that day. Whether you want to energize your sex life for yourself, for a lover, or so you can channel that energy elsewhere, 
try tuning into Dipsy because listeners of Lovers and Friends get a 30 day free trial. Yes, it's freaky, it's fun, and it's free. Go to dipsy.com slash lovers. That's dipsy.com slash lovers for 30 days of full access for free. Dipsy.com slash lovers. Well, maybe you haven't been with someone who knows what you want. (laughs) And you think you know what I want? I think you're tired of making decisions. You want someone who's going to take control. Let's talk about (laughs) celibacy. Okay. (laughs) I try my best not to apply the salt and pepper song to everything. Okay. But this feels right because it's the opposite. Let's talk about celibacy, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Yes. Let's talk about celibacy. So where do we begin? You tell me. You have a great story for me. I want to start there. Well, honestly enough, I actually, it w- I was in my 20s before I even lost my virginity. Which is 20? Uh, for me, it was 21. Okay. And uh, after that, I was kind of wild. You know, it was almost like I was let off the leash. The tiger was out the cage. It was a wrap. And so I developed a mindset of like, to me, you couldn't pay me to be celibate. Like the idea of celibacy was ridiculous, you well, know. You did it for twenty-one years. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but at that point, I, I got I forgot all about those twenty-one years. I guess I can't remember what it was like anymore. And so, it, it really the the even thought of even entertaining it, it was from spiritual people or religious people coming to me, and they would come to me with the Bible and you know you need to be doing this. And literally back then, I was like, listen, don't come over here with all that. And I would defend having sex by saying, every other sin, I feel guilty if I do it. I feel bad about it. I do not feel bad after having sex. So to me, it makes no sense that this would be an actual sin when I feel great, she feels great. What's the problem? And so, and I and I said these words, and it came back to haunt me later. I said, I will stop having sex when I feel guilty afterwards. When I feel bad about it, I'll stop. Fast forward. I start having a lot of spiritual occurrences happening, all right, to the point where I thought I was going crazy. Go to a therapist to try to figure out what's going on. And she was like, well, maybe you're stressed. And I said, no, I've been stressed before. I was having nonstop dreams, vivid dreams. So I went from having dreams I couldn't remember, not vivid at all, to very vivid, specific dreams every night. On top of that, There were things happening in my life. Like people would see me as a very lucky person back then. Lucky to the point where I even like worked at a job in three months, won a car at the job. Right, This wild stuff would happen, okay? But all of a sudden, bad stuff kept happening. And it was a friend of mine who was like, you know, she she thought someone put voodoo on me. So she was like, you need to go figure out what's going on here because I, for as long as I've known you, I've never seen your life like this. So anyways... In that process of all these spiritual things happening and me trying to figure stuff out, um, I'm still sexually active, but now all of a sudden, I feel guilty. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Was your guilt, I hurt this person, I'm hurting myself? At that time, it was, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I I didn't have the full answer as to why, other than maybe feeling like, God does not want me doing this. I need to stop. And so I kept trying to push, kept trying to push. Literally, I just thought I would sex my way out of (laughs) this, right? (laughs) Until one day, the last time it happened was like this woman who, super attracted to her, it was an amazing experience sexually, and I still felt bad afterwards. And then I was like, okay, I can't keep doing this. Clearly, something's going on. I can't explain it. The best thing for me to do right now is just to stop. And that's what started my first... Because I've had a couple cycles, but my first cycle of being celibate. So we're talking 21, you started having copious amounts of sex, (laughs) all of the sex. What age did you start celibacy? The celibacy, that first round, I want to say 27. I'm having a hard time remembering exactly, but But I think it was 27. It lasted five years, you said, right? Well, no. So that one lasted three years. You had one for three years and one for five years? Yes. You're really good at this. <laughs> You're really good. I was good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, so I went, and I think the first three years was me, it was what I call my wilderness period, to where it was like, all right, all this spiritual stuff is happening. I'm feeling this conviction. This doesn't make sense for me to keep doing this if I'm feeling this way. I don't know what's going on. But I just know I need to just stop. So to me, 
it wasn't being done with intention as much as more obedience, okay? But without a clarity of what this is supposed to be about. I feel like God had to break me down to rebuild me. And I had this moment, I'll never forget, where for the, I want to say during those three years, I was a shell of myself, all right? I was not the ambitious, go-getting, high-energy person I used to be. I was just in the house. I felt like I was, it was like I was in depression to a certain extent. And so I remember a family friend, he he came up, I was in Atlanta at the time, he came up, he saw me, and he looks, he chewed me out. He's like, what the hell's going on with you? This isn't who you are. You know, what, what are you doing with yourself? And it kind of woke me up because my, my issue was I didn't know at the time how to be my bold, energetic self, the, the way that I truly am, but within God's dynamic, so to speak. But then I realized it after that speech by him, it clicked. And it was like, wait a minute, I can be who I am. But again, just do it through God. You know what I'm saying? I can be bold in speaking truth that God wants me to speak. I can be high energy. Now, yes, the high sexual energy part, I still have to learn how to manage that, but I don't need to suppress it because mm. suppressing it was not doing me any favors. All right? Now, even though I, I had that revelation, I was still battling the sexual energy part. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, again, I, like I said, after I fell off for the year, I remember a string of, you know, dating some women and just feeling spiritually God was saying, leave the women alone. Leave the women alone. But this time, so this is the difference. This cycle, which ended up becoming the five years, I really felt like this is what, what's the word I'm looking for? This is what propelled me, excuse me, career-wise. This is what propelled me in my purpose, all right? That it was about leaving the women alone because I needed to dig deep into what God was sending me off to do, so to speak. And that was the speaking on relationships and the videos. And so that's where my greatest growth in my field came, was in those five years of being celibate. Interesting. So the five golden years. Yes. And they really were golden because that to me was when I really got to focus in on the work. I feel like, again, my understanding of people and women grew exponentially during those five years standpoint. And you didn't miss sex the way that you did in those three years. Um, I, you know, I just wasn't as concerned. I, I can't even say whether I was missing it, not missing it. There was moments, of course, you know, but ultimately I think I knew what I was on the path to doing. So I was accepting of this is just a sacrifice that has to be made. You know what I'm saying? And I'm okay with that sacrifice. Because we were talking about something really interesting too, wherein you learned about testosterone levels and you explored that more for yourself. Mm -hmm. And a big part of not missing it was a part of a lack of drive that may have come from a lack of testosterone. Yes. I think I think there's a few factors. So one, going back to the point that you made about the sexual transmutation. So I actually had a conversation just the other day with a good friend of mine. And one thing I've seen is that a lot of highly successful, highly ambitious, highly driven men, all high sexual energy. Um, I've yet to meet one that even believes in monogamy, to be honest with you, okay? But we were talking about it, and I said, we made the point that, you know, it might have been a lot easier for me to be abstinent back then because I had this thing to work towards, this big purpose that I had to build. So I had this place to transmute my energy into, the problem is once you become very successful, you don't have as much to transmute into anymore. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yes, there's still work to do. There's still things to build. But it's not like those grinding years when you're trying to establish things and get it off the ground and get it ro running smoothly. There's a difference in that, that penetrative energy when you're forging your path and you're mm -hmm. literally penetrating the world, trying to make a way for yourself to when you've actually found it and now there's more of a maintenance. Yes, and so now that that creates more sexual energy that you have to figure out how to manage and where to put it and what to do with it. I was just so deep into my work. Yes. That's it. It was all about the work. You know, I wasn't going on trips. I wasn't partying. I wasn't doing anything but just working. Mm. And that's what filled me up. So let's talk about where we're at now then. Okay. So now, <laughs> so as I mentioned to you off camera before, you know, the other factor outside of I had this place to put all my energy into, 
I did come later on discover that my testosterone was low that back then. And it was as low as 229. Now, I don't know exactly what it was during the five years, but I can only imagine it was somewhere in the vicinity of that. You okay? gave me a really teachable, great teachable moment about testosterone, which I would love for you to share about the levels and how they have been adjusted over time yes. because of the decline. So essentially, right now, the doctor will tell you a healthy testosterone level in adult male is from 300 to 800. Okay. However, in the 1960s, I believe it was, the levels were 500 to 900. So they've adjusted the levels and lowered them to accommodate all the men who are suffering from much lower testosterone. I do think that it may also be to open the door to, well, no, it's not even to open, I was going to say to open the door to treatment, but no, that would actually decrease the door of treatment because if they kept it at 500, so many men would find out right now they're way below where they should be. Yes. So there are men going to the doctor getting tested and they're like 350 and the doctor's like, you're okay. No, you're not okay. You're nowhere close to optimal for a man. And so a lot of men are struggling with this and don't even know about it. You have 20-year-old men now who have the testosterone that rivals a 60-year-old man from 40 years ago. So it's thrown a lot of things off, but it explains why you have, there, there are a lot of men who are disengaged with pursuing women, having the same energy for women that men used to have. Part of that is because the testosterone is not there. But all that to say, getting back to my situation, yeah, I, I, I saw that I did have low testosterone at the time. And so fast forward to now where I've learned how to increase my testosterone naturally and I'm I'm so much more healthier and in shape now than I've ever been. And so it's created a much greater struggle with trying to be abstinent. You know what I'm saying? On top of the fact that, I mean, if, if we're going to keep it all the way real, I'm a successful guy. I'm a well-known person. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of opportunity for me. You know, I've had men come to me when I'm on tour and say, how do you do it? How do you not just like take advantage and just be with all these different women? And now for me, part of what helps me is my relationship with God and my awareness of how some of these situations are affecting these women, even when they're saying it's not. All right. And so what does that mean? What that means is that let me first say I'm a very, I'm a, an above average aware guy. As I mentioned earlier. Oops. I'm sorry. <laughs> You got it? Let me get I could it. add a sandbag. If I if I sense that, okay, you're a woman who can get very emotionally caught up when you engage sexually, and I know that I cannot give you or I'm not able or willing to give you what you're ultimately looking for, then for me, it's 10 times, 100 times harder to still move forward and sleep with you. You know what I'm saying? So for that reason, that causes me to be still hesitant and be cautious uh, whereas if I even think back to when, before I got spiritual and I was unaware, it was nothing. It was easy. Well, do you also have the factor of people are highly drawn and attracted to you because you're a man of great moral value who has a lot of integrity, who's a man of God. And so as much as they're luring you into these acts, they'll judge you for it. If you, so here, here's, if here's what I've experienced. On, on one end, there's an attraction. On another end, there's intimidation, all right, where some women will think, well, he would judge me, the type of woman that I am, if I try to engage with him in any kind of way. Let me just not even set myself up for this, right? But then once I have engaged sexually, let's say, with a woman, she's even more drawn in after she realizes there's a lot more to me yes. <laughs> than just, you know, this high moral spiritual guy. Like, I'm still a guy. I'm still a man. I, you know. Read Stefan's a freak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just saying. There's, you know. And so it actually doesn't. I, I've never felt that judgment. The only time I felt judgment and it, and it, and I felt like it was just weaponized judgment because again the woman wasn't getting what she ultimately wanted was the idea of oh well you're you you're down to to engage with me sexually but you don't want a relationship but here's the thing I'll ne I don't lie to anybody I'm very transparent very honest because to me no matter what happens I don't I don't want people to have a bad experience with me 
I want it to be positive. Yes. And so to me, I want you to know what you're getting yourself into. And if this doesn't work, that's perfectly fine. You know? And again, it's not like I do this all the time, but I've had moments. I'm not perfect. You know? So walk me through your psyche right now of like celibacy. Um, my, my mindset is still, I believe in the power of it. I believe that more people should embrace it at least for a season in their life. Okay. But you have to go into it with intention. This is a tool to be used to remove distractions, to get back in tune with yourself, to get closer to God. Because if you don't go into it intentionally, that's where I think people end up feeling like this sucked. This was a waste of time because you didn't go into it using it the way it should be used. So to me, it's it's still very powerful, very useful, something I still encourage. However, again, to be honest, it's a struggle for me as a man where I'm at. Even in the context of when people compare their celibacy, like, well, I've been celibate for X amount of years. And in my head, I'm like, your celibacy ain't mine. Yeah. You can't even compare it to what I have to go through. All right? Like, it's almost like I use the analogy. It's like someone saying, I'm giving up chocolate. But you live 50 miles from the chocolate store. You can barely afford some chocolate. And there ain't no chocolate in your house. All right? It's going to be easier for you to go on this journey. I live right next to the chocolate store. <laughs> I damn near live in it. And the chocolate <laughs> store comes over a lot to ask exactly, for sugar. Exactly, yes. <laughs> All right? It's a lot. It's a different ball game. And that's just from experience, but then it's a different ball game from man to woman. I, I think a lot of women do not understand how we are wired biologically that pushes us towards sex and, and, and mating or and reproduction, all these different things. So it's it's just it's it's a difficult thing to navigate through, but it's never something that I'm gonna say, oh, to hell with it completely, or it's pointless, or it's no, it's definitely a wonderful and beautiful thing, but you gotta be intentional about it. Well, then why call it into your life right now with an awareness that you have the ability to channel the sexual energy into other places, with the awareness of sex is something that you're good at, that you enjoy doing, that enriches your life in a positive way, especially if you put in boundaries to ensure people know exactly what they're getting, um, that you have a great relationship with God, that you feel clear on that. So with all those things in mind, what advantage could celibacy offer you right now? Well, I think, again, so for me personally, and I think for people in general, even when we've reached a certain level of understanding and, um, and success and maturity and healing all these things, it's still possible for sex or sex with specific individuals to end up clouding our judgment and become a distraction. You have to be very careful with who you engage with. Hell, not who you even let in your house, all right? You don't know what they're carrying with what they're carrying with them and how that can impact you. Energetically? So, energetically. Because to me, when you energetically, spiritually is kind of hand in hand. But yes, it, it 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 can affect you in both ways. But I guess then because you have the sensitivity, why not trust that intuition that you can pick partners that would be positive? I'm not even gonna lie to you. I never thought of it, thought about that for a second, but you're right. <laughs> I guess, well, the conflict with that is because I guess there's always a part of me that if I go on a date, there's a very high chance this woman is going to like me, all right? Genuinely like me. See, a lot of women go on these dates with men and they're convincing themselves of reasons to even go on this date and give it a chance. And a lot of times they don't really like the guy, but they may find some kind of benefit of continuing to see this guy. Maybe it's he pays for stuff. Maybe she's just bored, whatever the case may be. For me, they actually like me, the person, which draws them in even more. So now it makes dating hard because I can't be for everybody. You see? And what I've learned is that when women see something that they really want, they forget about connection. They forget about the deeper necessities to making sure this can actually work. They're just locked into, I want this. Plain and simple. Because I always argue that women know connection better than men. But... They will rationalize past connection. They will rationalize past their intuition. Their intuition could be screaming at them saying, don't do it. <laughs> this is not for you. But if they've decided they want this, they move past that. You know, one thing I've learned is that if a man, and this is not telling men what to do to get sex, but if a man wants to make a woman more sexually receptive to him, he has to learn how to make her feel comfortable. All right? I think I have a natural gift of making people feel very comfortable around me. Because of that, when you add feeling comfortable, not feeling judged, 
then there being an attraction and all these things. And I'm also a very affectionate guy. That's another thing. Affection makes women very sexually receptive, especially if you're good at being affectionate, okay? So this is where it gets tricky because now if I try to be abstinent celibate, but I'm trying to date so I can find my wife or receive my wife, I am now putting myself back into the lion's den, so to speak. And now the chances of things popping off sexually just went up. And this is going to sound conceited again, but again, we're just speaking our truth. When you are an above average guy, one, it's not even reasonable for to expect it's going to be like, there's not a whole lot of me's. That's just the reality of it. There's just not. All right. If we looked at every measuring tool, I'm in like the one, I'm less than 1% to be honest with you. And so now by engaging with these different women, the, the concern is you're setting a bar in their life that's going to be very difficult for another man to move past. Oh, my God. No, listen. I know that sounds I know. bad. I'm not, oh, my gosh, and you because of what you're saying. I'm, oh, my gosh, and you because I really disagree. When I met my husband, I was dating around a lot. And one of the guys I was dating, he was a millionaire and famous and famous for his personality. Mm -hmm. So an amazing personality. Looked great, all of the above. Just like a really, like, quality stand-up person. And I was also dating Jared at the time, whom was sleeping on his friend's couch, was figuring it out. Like it was just kind of apples to orange in terms of where they were on paper. But the amount of attention and time and intimacy that I was able to get with Jared was just not possible because of that person's lifestyle. Yeah, The experience of you can enrich somebody because it allows them to get clear about what matters to them. It might encourage them to be like, you know what? He had these six things I really, really enjoyed. But you know what three were really, really impactful and I've never experienced before? Those three. Next relationship, I want to focus on someone who can give me that feeling. There is a positive that comes with experiencing something at a really high level that doesn't always lead to longing and comparing and despairing. And, and, I, and I agree with you. So I don't disagree. I guess the only, my only pushback is people's, individual's abil it, it, people's individual ability to process it that way. And I think that there are some who can and can appreciate it for what it is. And then there are many who at the very least struggle. They may at some point in their life be able to look back and say, you know what? It was a positive experience and I gained from it. And that is what it is. But some, it just seems to have a negative impact, you know? And yeah. I think also, again, and I think the, the key to me is this. But I guess because, that's what I'm going back to that thing. I never want to create a rule or an existence based on like the worst case scenario. Yeah. So true that. it is like, and I give this to a lot of women who are like, well, I don't want to lead somebody on. So I don't want to do this. It's like the experience of you is incredible and it's reciprocal and it's magical. You don't have to give somebody all of you in order for it to be a quality time. I get that to your point. And that negative bond thing might only be a phase that you hear about. Maybe they don't come back to you afterwards and say, it's been three years, and I know I called you a piece of shit, <laughs> even though you were clear that you couldn't be with me. But God damn it, I grew so much from our time together. And I love watching you to this day. And if you're ever in town again, let's get coffee. You know, because I think that you're great and really cool. I've moved on, but you've really positively impacted my life. This is actually a call to everybody who's ever had an amazing experience and been elevated by your time and attention and is now better for it. You need to come forward. <laughs> Given all that you've experienced, you arguably have put in your 10,000 hours of abstinence celibacy. You know this A thing really, <laughs> really well. Yeah. Um, if there is one thing that you want to communicate to people, you know, a checklist of things they should ask themselves or do before entering into or coming out of an abstinence, what would you say? I think one is, why are you doing this? So understand the intention behind it. Because again, I've heard some women they just got tired of men. So, okay, F these men. I'm just going to be celibate. But that's not really a good intention going into it. You know what I'm saying? So what are you doing this for? Two, what are you trying to now get out of it? All right? So what can, what what things can we put in place to make sure we are taking advantage of this time of abstinence? How can we grow throughout this process? You know what I'm saying? I think also do it for you, do it for God, don't do it for anyone else. So don't do it because society told you, I told you. It doesn't matter. All that matters is, like even with my story, notice I did not get into it until I felt a conviction within me that said, you got to stop. You know what I'm saying? 
and having that relationship with God. But anyone else, and it's the same thing on the flip side, because some, some people listening to this may want to be abstinent, but their friends are saying, that's ridiculous, that's stupid, you don't need to do that. No, whichever way you got to go, do what's best for you. You know what I'm saying? And just don't even worry about like, how long am I going to do this? Focus on the result that you're trying to achieve. Focus on the purpose of what this is. Because it can get really scary when you start thinking, oh my gosh, I, I got to be celibate for three years now? <laughs> like, what the hell? I didn't know it was going to be three. I didn't know it was going to be five years. I just knew I had to do it at that time, so I did it. And so that would be my my suggestions to them to make it a more successful experience, you know, and so that they can really gain out of it what they need to gain. And on the cautionary side, you know, kind of speaking to ensuring that it's not a lack of drive, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. So I think, um, I definitely think, so I will say this, during the abstinence period, and even if you're not going to be abstinent, you got to go to the doctor and get yourself checked out. But more specifically, ask the doctor for your levels to get checked. For whatever reason, doctors do not suggest that to us, all right? You got to go in there and say, I want to get my testosterone, my estrogen, vitamin D, uh, B12, you can even check out. You know, there's a few other things, but those are some essential things. Because for even on the side of, let's say you're feeling depressed, that could be a vitamin D deficiency. And simply fixing that, you can feel like a whole new person. So I definitely think that abstinence or not, Get yourself checked out so you understand. And also, don't assume that the way you feel is normal. And what I mean by that is this. I didn't check myself out for so long because I thought me being tired is just, that's just how I am. That's just, it's just normal. It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? My lack of drive in certain times, I'm just going through things. I'm just depressed. We're too quick to just throw this label on it or accept it as just as how we are when no, something's off, you know? And so even if you don't think there's something off, just be safe. Go get yourself checked out and see if there's some things you can easily improve health-wise. Do you want to end the top the podcast topless? <laughs> no. Do you? Because you're in great shape. You said it. You've dropped it many times. Now Listen, I want to no. see. I'm sure they want to see too. I still got some work to do. I still got really? some work to do. Yes. I still got some work to do. It's looking really great underneath well, this green shirt. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I guess we'll end not on a high note, but definitely a high note because your time was enough. Yeah. Even you. without you being topless, you were enough. <laughs> Well, that was a lot of fun. Shout out to you, Stefan Speaks, for coming through Lovers and Friends, the podcast, and for sharing while you're in the process of figuring out what your progress looks like. It's not easy to do that. It's a lot simpler to share things in hindsight once you've already figured out, once you've already done and decided, but to let people into your current psyche and to give them a tour of your life right now as you're figuring it out takes a lot of bravery, and I hope you guys don't take that for granted or take advantage of that. Um, it's easy to do that. It's easy to pick somebody apart when they are trying to put together their pieces. So do not be guilty of doing that. And I surely um, don't take it for granted. And that is why I am a follower of Stefan Speaks. And if you want to join me, go to Stefan Speaks on Instagram to follow him there. He also has a new book, which was sitting between us during the interview called Finding Love After Heartbreak. Another good place to go is YouTube. He also has a website and I will try to add all of the links I can in the show notes below. I did do it after ending a very long-term relationship. I was with the same person from when I was 14 till I was about 23. And the information that I got out of it about what I wanted for the next person that I allowed to enter my body was pivotal and how I wanted to be treated by them and how I wanted them to make me feel and just the excitement that comes with a good makeout party um, and now I have been with my partner for 13 years we have two children and we still love a good makeout party I was in a long-term relationship almost six years I'm about halfway through it I was approached to go celibate until we got married, even though we had already been having sex. Um, initially, it brought up an insecurity within myself, but that time during the celibacy, it didn't really do anything for me. And essentially, we aren't together anymore. Yeah, man, looking back at it, I feel 
stupid or okay ashamed about it but at the same time i had to accept it and and learn from it abstaining from sex actually helped me out in the long run it helped me pick better partners for myself it also gave me more awareness of self-worth and i always encourage people who act as if they can live without sex whether it's men or women i always try to you know tell them that if you abstain from sex or if you choose the celibacy life it can actually help you out in the long run okay let's answer some of your questions on celibacy oh, yes, wait a minute, the both, i am single so how do i tell people that i'm considering dating now that i am abstaining from sex i think you tell people when the topic of sex comes up naturally whether that is because it feels like a natural weave for you. You guys were talking about some TV show, Game of Thrones and the sex scenes, and you were like, wow, that really turned me on and made me think about you know, what I'm going to miss during abstaining from sex. And it was like, oh, so hard to watch, but also really, really satisfying. At the end of the day, I'm really happy with my decision. But yeah, it's really cool to watch other people excitedly have sex as well. Whatever it is your version is, but weaving it in there in a way that is empowering not depressing. You are not telling somebody that you are stopping sex because of what you don't have or haven't had, but instead you're stopping sex because you want to invite a different energy and you want to slow things down so you can really see what that energy is before you collide with it. I think that that, again, I've heard that tip before when it comes to dating apps, you know, rather than saying like, I'm not looking for, really keep it to I am looking for. And same when it comes to celibacy. What are you looking for in a celibacy? What excites you about it? And if you can't answer that question with a smile on your face, you should probably go back to the drawing board on why you're doing it to begin with. Uh, but if you can, lean into that smile. Last question. I've been celibate for almost a year, but I had a slip up. Now what do I do? You do it again. You have sex again. Or you don't do it again and you re-engage with celibacy. Nobody is upstairs keeping score. You might believe that someone is if you do, but I don't believe that anyone's up there keeping score against us. And I believe that's really about the why, why are you choosing to be celibate and the what, what are you getting um, back from giving this part of your sex life up? And if you have sex and you have a little lapse there, it's an opportunity to reassess your why and to see if the what is still possible through that why. And if it is, and very much is, go back to what you were doing, dust yourself off, try again, and find joy in the laps. Don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up over it. Nothing you could do about it now. And maybe come up with new strategies to choose something different the next time you're faced with temptation. But on the flip side, if you do that reassessment and you realize that the why no longer applies and the what is already satisfied or can be satisfied through a different means, then stop being celibate. I don't, yeah. There's also a really great episode, if you are new to Lovers and Friends, I did with Shameless Maya, who really leaned into this from the perspective of religion. And um, I thought it was, I still believe it's a really great listen if you still have some questions after this episode. And you might still have questions after that episode. In such a case, that's a great thing because the purpose here is to inspire meaningful dialogue. And whether that dialogue is with your own Lovers and Friends or with me, I'd be honored. And a great place to dialogue with me is in the rate and review section. Actually, I was reading through the rate and review section before this episode. And I was going to read them out, but it can turn into a little bit of a masturbation session because you guys are so lovely and just saying very, very kind things, which I value. But I would also love to mix in there. I'm not saying stop with the compliments. Let's be clear. But I'd love to mix it up. If when you rate and review, you could also really outline what parts of the episode that you liked, a lie that stood out to you, something that you want to double click on, a further insight that you have that I can share, or if there is a question that you have about last week's episode, that would be great because then this can become more of a conversation and less of you all sitting there listening to me read out how great people think that myself and the show are, which I love, but you might find more value in the former. Anyways, so much cool stuff coming. We got to do an interview with Becky G and we have been pursuing that conversation for quite some time. So I'm really thrilled to bring that to you all. We also have a great conversation with Jojo that we have taped. We have, like as I mentioned, a hormonal expert coming up. 
Um, just a lot of smart, interesting, invigorating discussions that I cannot wait for you to be a part of. So keep coming back. Bye. Lovers and friends. Lovers and friends. I'm going to take you on a trip, baby. I don't pretend. I said, lovers and friends. Uh, I'm going to hold you down, down to the end. I said, Lovers and Friends is executive produced by Shared Entertainment's Shan Boudram. It is produced by Shan and Krizia Cruz with production support from Two West Entertainment's Adam Krasner and Brianna Barone. The Lovers and Friends theme song is produced by Sean Ross and performed by Jared Brady, my husband, who also does the scoring and engineering on our episodes. Lovers and Friends is powered by Audio Boom and made possible by our incredible sponsors who you can and please, I hope you do, show love to by reading our show notes.